Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, Sheila. Uh, thank you, distinguished guests. Uh, thank you, Secretary Dar uh, uh, and uh, Leo uh, for, for that uh, inspiring um, speech on the topic, uh, which as at hand, it's quite a challenge for me to summarize a book. It's not a very long book. Don't want to discourage you from reading it, but still it's a book. And it's difficult to summarize this in uh, 20 minutes, but, but let me try. Next slide, please. So why, why did we write this book? Next. Well, we realized that uh, for many years, irrigation actually languished, no? especially since the 90s. So there was a big surge actually during uh, the martial law years. Uh, late 60s, 70s. You can see this in this chart. No, this is the uh, chart of public investments in irrigation. It's been rendered uh, comparable over time by uh, correcting for prices to the year 2000. So we have this surge in the 70s, and then with an economic crisis uh, that has never been seen in this country until very recently. No, but at that time that was purely due to an economic event, no? a balance of payments crisis in the early 80s. Now it's a, it's a different thing. It's a health crisis. But at that time, it's a balance of payments crisis. Our growth collapsed. And actually, for a long time, it, it languished there all the way through the 2000s. And it was uh, together with the collapse of economic growth, there was also a collapse of government spending across the board including spending on irrigation and then there was recovery of irrigation spending right around 2005 onwards especially this was really propelled by the if you can recall way back in 2008 there was a really severe uh, world food price crisis uh, affecting uh, various cereals commodities and in particular rice cost you know drove the whole world rice market into a panic and there was a lot of policy responses. One of the repercussions was a strong investment in rice productivity, including irrigation in the Philippines. So you can see that trend, no? We call this the resurgence, the revitalization. That that uh, last circle, last ellipse, <laughs> ellipse that you see there, uh, that, that is the driving force behind, you know, what? Was it effective? Um, were, were public funds, because this is all public funds, no? Uh, were, were they properly used? Did, did the public sector or did the taxpayer get bang for their buck for, for all of these investments? Did it help, no? Did it achieve the social objectives? Did it help farmers? Did it help uh, assure food security for consumers and so forth? Now, note that uh, in, from 2008 onwards, this is now sneezing matter. Uh, there is a 24.4 billion appropriation from 2008 to 2012, uh, average annual. Then from 2013 to 2018, about 32.3 billion. Okay, and actually that rose a little bit, but now it is right about those levels uh, in the 2020 budget. Anyway, the, the point is very, very large. It's really a resurgent or a revitalized uh, surge of investment. Uh, in our irrigation program. Next. So yeah, I've recounted the reasons. There was a full food price crisis. Then turns out that uh, one of the reasons why that uh, we we had uh, more bond spending on irrigation is because we didn't have money actually. So we prioritized other things. But once we started to have what we economists call fiscal space. Then one of the priority measures that we wanted to spend that uh, that additional those additional resources was actually uh, irrigation, uh, particularly irrigation yeah, agricultural development in general. But within that broad subset of uh, interventions within agricultural development, irrigation was pinpointed to be a priority investment. So the the the, the spending was driven by if you look at the uh, current Philippine development plan, the idea was we have an irrigation area ratio of 65%. What does that mean? We identified the potential irrigable quote-unquote area, area that could be irrigated, 
and the area already irrigated, the ratio of the latter to the former uh, in 2015 was 57.33%. The aim is by the time this uh, administration steps down by next year, that ratio will rise to 65%. 65%, 65.07%. In addition, other than expanding the area under irrigation, the existing areas already being irrigated, uh, if they were found to be, well, actually, right now, whether they're found to be costly or not, right now, all of those uh, irrigation service areas under the public sector, so uh, being the national irrigation system and other small scale irrigation systems uh, controlled by the Philippine government, Irrigation service fee now uh, is is, is uh, revoked, is repealed. No, it's all the, the irrigation service of those systems is now all free since uh, 2018 by virtue of Republic Act 10969. So, in addition to pouring in money for investments in expanding the irrigable the irrigated area, uh, Philippine government has poured in more money to make operations maintenance management of the existing uh, irrigation systems free to farmers for availing of it of them no, next okay so lots of resources so probably there's a need for stock taking no uh, what has been the benefit as i've mentioned to farmers to the economy at large was their bang for the buck uh, for these taxpayer uh, expenditures now we covered the gamut of uh, you know possible topics for evaluating all of these uh, investments. No, we covered national irrigation systems, meaning irrigation systems are directly controlled by the national government through uh, the main uh, uh, national agency for irrigation, which is the National uh, Irrigation Administration. Uh, we also covered communal irrigation systems, also a very sizable sector uh, for the specific statistics on the areas of each, you have to read book. So, so, although a lot of this is already also available in the excellent PSA website uh, on, on the issue, uh, on, on this topic. Um, uh, th these systems are smaller scale systems. They were actually mostly 99% assisted by uh, the, the NIA itself, but unlike the NIS, which are still managed by NIA, the CIS, the communal systems, though built by NIA, are now being managed by uh, farmer associations. So, uh, nonetheless, we covered those uh, in, in this study. Uh, actually, it's not like we started this last year or even two years ago. We actually started this uh, in 2012. Actually, perhaps even earlier, no? if you look, look at even earlier studies, but uh, we, we uh, began this program in earnest around about 2012, uh, when we had uh, a, a rapid appraisal uh, study being done earlier, uh, funded by uh, Department of Budget and Management, under the zero-based budgeting, if you can recall that. No? Now, the approach we took here, so there are many studies actually on irrigation. But I would like to think that uh, we took a fairly unique approach here, that we looked at the, uh, uh, the, the, the whole cycle uh, of uh, irrigation uh, investment programming, starting from the planning stage, the design and planning stage, the implementation, the actual construction, building the facility, uh, operating the facility, uh, and then after operating, managing it, sustaining it, maintaining it, uh, monitoring and evaluating uh, the operations. Uh, throughout all of those cycles, we looked at issues related to the performance of the system, so various technical issues, irrigation intensity, all of these um, exotic uh, <laughs> indicators compiled by engineers. So this is a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, I'm an economist, but uh, by no means did we uh, confine the expert definitely actually the main thrust of this is actually uh, agricultural engineers uh, much of the evaluation here as well as uh, you know uh, other experts uh, uh, hydrology experts and of course uh, policy research uh, uh, like myself no looking at performance design management 
and even governance issues. So we paid particular um, uh, attention to governance because all the past literature said, despite all what we can say about uh, you know the investment in engineering, the problems or flaws there, in the end, we, we have a meta sort of meta mechanism that supports to address all of this, which is the institutional and governance arrangements. But those past teachers have said, medyo kinakapus pa rin, no? we, we, we still haven't been able to fix that. Why not? So we have to step back a bit and say, what, what's the issue in the governance? Why is that very mechanism supposed to troubleshoot the problems of the irrigation sector not able to do it? So we had a deep look at governance, no? So uh, there have been various assessments, but we would like to think that this is the most recent state-of-the-art assessment. That's why we said 21st century. We took cognizance of the fact that this is the resurgent program. Uh, we realized that uh, the, all, the previous rounds of uh, irrigation were great, justified in their time, but now, 21st, uh, 21st century irrigation is confronting uh, issues and problems of the 21st century. 21st century Philippine agriculture, uh, the issues mentioned by uh, Cosleo uh, a while ago, the problem, the issues of diversification, productivity, uh, widespread poverty uh, persisting in the sector, as well as you know the continuing challenges, climate change. Uh, is, uh, is is also uh, treated uh, in, in, in the book, in the various chapters of the book. Next, please. Okay, so uh, if you read the structure of the book, we cover, as, as I said, no, an introductory chapter, like what I'm saying, giving you now an overview, the national systems, communal systems, an in-depth look at the water resources, uh, governance issues, uh, we have a separate chapter looking at the most recent uh, policy innovation, which is the free irrigation service, uh, deserves its own chapter. Uh, being a policy research, as I said, no, one main problem is did we get bang for the buck? That's a whole chapter in itself, chapter seven, and then putting it all together in chapter eight. So uh, I suggest, obviously, that you read the whole report. No? But uh, the main messages are in chapter one and eight. And the main message, you have really no time, just go to chapter eight, no? But chapter eight will be a bit, I admit, mystifying to read without having to go through chapters uh, one to seven. So I really urge you to read the whole book. <laughs> in short, next. All right, so just to give you a flavor, no? A lot of this will be presented with very shallow explanation. Unfortunately, if you want to see the in-depth analysis behind all of these statements, you have to, yeah, I'm gonna repeat this over and over. You have to read the book, okay? Uh, so I said, no, we organized the book mostly in terms of the various stages in uh, an irrigation investment program. So issues in project in, uh, identification, what issues did we see? Click please. Uh, Doc Leo already mentioned, or through the message of uh, Secretary Dar, the issue of political interference and how DA wants to address it. Uh, we found that that's uh, continuing to be an issue. Uh, now, of course, when we look at DBM documents and so on, there's a lot of justification based on potential area. But our review found that potential area may not be a reliable guide to what is the exact area suited for irrigation systems, no? Uh, a lot of the estimates of potential area are not updated in terms of land use. So we have this estimate of potential area, but then over time, some areas have been, say, uh, converted to built up area. So in Indonesia, there is no longer a potential area, but somehow the subtraction is not done. Uh, a deeper assessment in terms of soil suitability. Now, a lot of these systems are flood, you know, uh, flood uh, irrigation. Frankly, no, the, our irrigation is not really suited for the high value crops, which don't necessarily need uh, the flooded irrigation. But if you have a flooded irrigation system, then that's uh, mostly rice and other water loving plants. 
Uh, but then if you look at the soil, so if you map it with the uh, BSWM soil suitability maps, a lot of there, there we found in our some of the systems we covered, especially in NIS, that the coverage of the area includes soils, areas of soils which are not suitable uh, for planting rice. So that's another that should have been also adjust uh, a means to adjust uh, the potential area. But we found in the actual feasibility studies project identification, this was not done. On the other hand. Areas above 3% slope are excluded, at least for NIS, but there is inconsistent treatment because if you look at CIS, areas up to 8% slope are accepted as uh, for estimating potential irrigation area, uh, at least in terms in practice, no, if, if not officially. So wh 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 how, how do we square this con uh, uh, inconsistency? So. Um, in some areas, we may have overestimated. In some other respects, we may have underestimated the potential area. Uh, also, the identifying, you know, this is a highly technical matter, no? identifying, okay, this particular uh, area, we see this watershed, we see the, the contours, the terrain, the, the types of crops, this is suitable. It, it's not no joke being able to make that assertion in a factual and credible and uh, Technical, technically viable way. No? Uh, unfortunately, we found also that after a rationalization program in the late 2000s undergone by NIA, a lot of the expertise that they had uh, to be able to properly do a project identification throughout the archipelago uh, was lost, essentially. A lot of these uh, experts uh, simply retired, separated from the service. So naturally, we have to you know, counteract these uh, findings with certain recommendations. We need to build capacity, rebuild, essentially, rebuild capacity for project identification. There has to be closer coordination with DA and local government units. Why? Because it's these local DA in its central office uh, may not have all of the information, even if you, you know, they ask help from the regional offices, they still will not have the information down to the municipal and even barangay levels. LGUs could actually advise them, no, this is suitable area, not suitable area. Uh, consider land use trends, especially if you don't have an updated land use map down to a high resolution level. And when uh, assessing potential area, not just look at the slope or uh, soil, soil suitability, we also want to look at uh, available water resources. And the hard chapter uh, on uh, water resources, that the chapter you saw a while ago, uh, it, it underscores that point uh, very carefully, um, especially not just now, but also taking into account potential problems, precipitation trends in the future, uh, looking forward to uh, trends in climate change. So, uh, well, the big issue in Philippines is not really uh, a long-term decline in the uh, average precipitation but actually greater volatility so greater extremes highs and lows of precipitation in many areas of the country and uh, this has to be anticipated going forward no? uh, in, in future planning for uh, irrigation areas and also as well as uh, operations and maintenance of current systems next please so moving now to project design and appraisal findings please so actually, uh, so beyond, okay, let's, ident that, that was the previous slide, no, identifying the project. Now, uh, this seems to be a viable project. So that's kind of pre-feasibility. Now we go to the actual feasibility. Uh, if we actually put in the money, how much does it cost? Uh, what are the projected benefits? And the projected benefits, are, are they worth it? No? So uh, turns out that our review, especially if the governance found that uh, there were insufficient resources and time spent uh, for project appraisal. So uh, in some past studies, we actually saw that there was a large, after you reviewed you know, uh, what, what really transpired, the actual costs and benefits, there was a large revision of the figures. And one possible reason is because at the outset, before actually doing the project, maybe not enough time was spent and resources were spent in properly estimating and taking into account contingencies. 
Uh, we also found that there was a lack of consultative process in design. So my own person, I, I tried to join as much field work and uh, consultation of farmers uh, as possible in this project. And I remember that uh, uh, we saw this layout in design. And I asked, okay, so did we follow all of this? And then uh, one engineer said, well, the farmer said, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't operate this lateral canal. And I asked, why did the farmers object? Uh, because uh, uh, when we tried it, uh, it created flooding problems during rainy season. So they requested it to be killed. So we, we, we blocked it up and we killed it. So uh, yeah, could you not have taken that into account when you designed the project? Apparently not, no. I was told later, I will not mention which irrigation project this is. This project was designed entirely in, uh, in a certain large country, the largest economy in the world. The engineers who designed it never saw Philippines. And then they just uh, emailed the blueprints. Anyway, so uh, this is the problem no, without proper consultation uh, in terms of uh, design. So um, a lot of uh, conflicting or overlapping roles, lack of coordination with other agencies. It's clear that you have to consult with DNR if you want to protect the watershed. You have to consult with local governments if you want to ensure that uh, irrigation uh, irrigators associations uh, will be on board and will will uh, operate it and manage it properly, especially for communal systems and on and on and on. But actually, it's it's largely so the money is given to this agency. This agency will just do based on its own terms of reference and not really, frankly, not really care. No, uh, the wider significance of the, this project. So our recommendations are to strictly adhere to benefit cost analysis rather than uh, you know, relying on uh, some caprice or whim of a decision maker at the time. Now, I want this project. No, my constituency demands this project. So let's push this through. Uh, if the benefit cost analysis doesn't really justify it, uh, then why push through with it? Maybe the taxpayer's money can be better put elsewhere. Implement design improvements towards greater diversification. So maybe rice is not the best use, some other use. Maybe the design shouldn't be always flooded agriculture, some other agriculture emphasizing different configuration of the system has to be considered. Uh, we may not need to flood large patches of land if, you know, smaller scales, uh, smaller patches of land uh, may be a more uh, cost effective way of uh, um, designing the system. And of course, consultation with farmers, okay? uh to avoid problems like like uh, i wanted uh, i mentioned a while ago as well as explore the multiple uses of water no? sometimes or actually very often especially for the larger projects it is not possible to justify a big irrigation project purely on the basis of crop agriculture alone but uh, note that uh, properly designed agriculture uh, irrigation projects have wide variety of uses they can be used for drainage they can be used for uh, hydropower, uh, for fisheries, and other benefits. If you value those, then maybe we can justify some of these projects, assuming that those other benefits are actually realized by a well-designed and well-implemented project. Next, please. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on as quickly as I can, no? because uh, uh, rather than give you all of the details, I'll just give you a flavor of what's, what's in the book, okay? When we operate the systems, we have found that a lot of these systems suffer degradation and poor performance. A big problem is siltation because uh, the company watershed is often very much denuded. So we had an estimate of, uh, okay, after so many years, we'll need to do dredging and rehabilitation. But those so many years, if it's 20 years, actually it's 10 years. And then we had to do it, but then it's not in our plan, right? Why was it 10 years rather than 20 years? Because the nearby forest was denuded faster than what was expected in the feasibility study. So we found that and we'll have to address that. No? Uh, there are also problems, so that's the uh, outside the system, but even within the system, uh, despite the fact that we have organized, we have very well organized irrigation associations, but even they confront challenges in governing properly and addressing water theft, water um, uh, lack of compliance uh, with the directives and so on. 
Uh, the free irrigation system also increases the demand on NIA to, to monitor uh, irrigation management transfer schemes. But uh, the budget has been mostly for additional subsidy, frankly, rather than actual uh, capacity for uh, NIA to, uh, to fund its additional role. So our recommendations are, naturally, uh, well, adopt a more holistic, we call asset management method, what that is. It's a more holistic approach towards managing uh, irrigation assets. Uh, specific uh, description is there in the, uh, uh, the book. Continuous capacity building of NIA especially for this particular methodology. Uh, we find that the O&M funding seems to be underestimated. So there's a formula okay, under FISA. Okay, this is uh, what we need to fund uh, since we're not asked, systems will continue to deteriorate. And then, of course, uh, we flagged the issue of integrating watershed management, control of uh, water resource, uh, management of water resources, control of erosions uh, with the actual downstream irrigation systems management. Okay, so to conclude, this irrigation thing is no joke. It's the single largest program for agricultural development in the country by far. Dwarfing even the farm to market roads, no? Triple, double, triple, uh, the second biggest investment, which is farm to market roads. Today, we have achieved the closest we have ever to closing the gap between the potential and actual irrigated area. Yet, despite all of the advances we've made with this revitalized resurgent irrigation program, we find that if you read the book, there's still considerable room for improvement. So I hope to stress this positive message. No, I've had a lot of, possibly a lot of criticisms. These are met very well. We're not, you know, uh, trying to take down any LGUs or politicians. Or we're saying that we have to work together because there's still a lot, you know, like like these people over here in this picture. No, uh, the, the, there's a big thing that they have to do, and rather than bickering with each other, they have to buckle down and work hard and, and fix the problem because sila din, they're the ones who will benefit from having this problem fixed. So uh, the best effort will be to combine all of our expertise, disciplines, tools, methodologies, including stakeholder participation, so that we can maximize the benefits we can get from our irrigation development program, both now and in the long run. Thank you.